Hello and welcome everybody to today's uh, YNS webinar. We are going to speak about magnification in neurosurgery. Um, we do have a lot of panelists today and a lot of talks today, so I'll keep the introduction rather short. Just for you, a quick run of housekeeping rules. If you have some questions, please press the hand button or type in your, your question. We'll discuss the question right after the, the talks. Um, there is no, no, uh, no more thing for me to say. Um, we just go ahead. Martin Lehechka, please, your talk. Well, thank you very much. Just a second, I will put my, I will start sharing my screen. So thank you much for the invitation to participate in your webinar. Uh, and my talk is going to be on exoscopes in cranial neurosurgery. Uh, I will give you my answer to the question at the end of the webinar. Uh, to start with, uh, as a disclosure, our department has a consultancy agreement with B. Brown. Uh, that's one of the producers of the exoscopes. So uh, just to give you a little bit background on, on my use of exoscopes, um, I started in 2018. My exoscopic surgeries are the orange ones. Yellow ones were, were still done with a microscope. What happened then over years is that I tried different devices and from the end of 2020, I started nearly exclusively using uh, exoscopes. So from then, then on, it was only like a um, couple of surgeries now and then, which I did with a microscope, but I have really shipped it altogether to an exoscope. Um, to give you an idea of what kind of things I do with the exoscope, so I'm mainly focusing on complex microsurgery, especially skull-based tumors, vascular, uh, some spinal tumors. Uh, but I mean, I'm doing very few of these, what would be maybe called like a basic spine. Uh, so it's really mainly complex stuff from which I do have uh, experience with. We have looked uh, at our own clinical comparisons between our results from the pre-exoscope era and comparing to them exoscopes. In all of these articles that have been published and in some of the which are still under, under work, we have found out that uh, at least uh, in our series, the exoscope has been non-inferior to a microscope. So we were not able to see any differences in the clinical results. Uh, there have been some differences in, let's say, timing of surgery and others, but, but not, not in the clinical sense. Uh, when I think about exoscopes, I think that there are three mo most important points that you have to assess if you want to make a comparison with a surgical microscope. The first thing is image. The other thing is movement. And the third is ease of use or adaptation to the new system. So let's start with an image. Uh, the level of detail, in my, my opinion, is very similar in both of the devices. Of course, uh, nothing can sort of beat the real uh, optical image or direct optical image. But with the present cameras that are available, so if you compare the left-sided uh, view that you get with a microscope with the right-sided view with, that you uh, get with an exoscope when dissecting along the optic nerve towards the chiasm, you can see that even the tiny structures are very well visualized with both of the systems. The images look different, that's true, but that's actually more related to the digital image processing, not, not as, much, uh, as much to the sharpness of the image as such. Another example, this is drilling of the internal auditory canal on the left side in a vestibular schwannoma. On the left side, again, you have a microscope image. On the right side, you have an exoscopic image. And um, again, in my opinion, the image quality is comparable. Actually, I would say that sometimes even the illumination is better with the exoscopic camera because you need less light to produce higher quality image than with a microscope. Because in microscope, the, all the light needs to reflect and gets all the way to your eyes, whereas, whereas the uh, exoscopic cameras, they can uh, change the gain depending on, on how much light is coming in. The biggest difference I would say is when you work in a deep and narrow cavity. So this is an example of a brainstem cavernoma, actually two different cases, but very similar ones, where I'm entering through the fourth ventricle and through the uh, floor of the fourth ventricle into the brainstem. Uh, this is done in sitting position. So it's a telovela approach, as you can see, entering between the tonsils of the cerebellum, getting first into the fourth ventricle. And there, of course, the difficulty is that you are in a relatively deep and narrow space. 
And just by looking at these images side by side, so you can already see that, um, I mean, some details can be visualized slightly better with the exoscopic image. That's because of the lack of light. Here it's uh, looking for the facial follicles with the, with the stimulation, so not to, not to injure it, and then making a tiny uh, opening into the actual flow of, of the fourth ventricle uh, at a safe site and going into the cavernoma. Uh, but uh, it's usually when you do this kind of side-by-side -side comparison, when you can really see the differences and, and each system has its advantages. And so I'm not completely, I'm not saying that the image wise, the exoscopes would be completely uh, all, all the time better, but I would definitely argue that some of the, let's say written arguments about how the optical image uh, from microscope is like always superior. I don't really think that's completely true because from the point of surgery, whether you have exact uh, representation of the colors as you are used with your eye, or uh, if they are somehow skewed, which is very typical for the exoscopes, that doesn't really matter so much. It's much more important that you see borders. So next we, next we come to movement. And um, when it comes to movement, so it very much depends on the style of surgery you are used to. Uh, my style is the one that I learned from my teacher, Juha Hernesiemi, who was using this very athletic type of microsurgery. So a lot of movement around the surgical field, standing up and, and really using your whole body to do, do microsurgery. So we all used uh, mouse switch, high magnification, which means moving all the time uh, with the microscope even. Uh, with the exoscope, the advantage is that if you want to go for this kind of high movement, uh, you can use the robotic arm of the camera, which means that you can keep your hands much for much longer periods of time in the operative field. Uh, with the microscope, you usually can do movement in plane, uh, even with the mouse switch. Whereas if you want to go up and down, that with the mouse switch is possible, it's more difficult if you are not using it. But one thing that you cannot do with the microscope is this kind of angular movement or tilting movement that you have to do always with your hand. Whereas with the exoscope and a proper system, you can actually do uh, that even with a foot pedal. So nowadays when I operate with the, uh, with the uh, robotic exoscope, what I do is I use my uh, right foot, I'm right-handed and right-footed, and uh, I'm actually doing all these kind of movements and adjustments of the camera with my right, fo uh, right foot. The problem is that then if you have a need to also use, let's say, high-speed drill, uh, ultrasonic aspirator, or others, it can get a little crowded with all the pedals in the place. But on the other hand, as you can see, you can, you can hold your hands for very relatively long periods of time in the operative field and still go on with your work. Uh, an example where you can really see how advantageous it is to be able to do all these angulations without removing your hands is entry into the pontine angle. So this is left side, cranial is on the right, uh, caudal is on the left, and it is just entering into the pontine angle. You can see the tentorium there underneath the bipolar, then you can see the dura covering the petrous bone. And the whole idea is, of course, that you go around the cerebellum to enter the pontine angle and this was a case of vestibular schwannoma, but I mean, the whole idea that you can keep both of your instruments in place and kind of cr crawl along the surface of the cerebellum and go deeper and deeper while uh, changing your angulation. So that's that's really kind of quite quite a big benefit compared to the way how you would have to do it with a microscope where you have to always remove your right or left hand and adjust the uh, angulation of the microscope. So that that definitely is one of the major advantages. So then we come to the third part, which is the ease of use. Uh, the basic microsurgical principles are very similar when you are working with angioscope, but there are some differences. And in a way you have to be open-minded to adapt to this new system or way of work. So one of the obvious things, which actually you don't immediately think about, but I mean, once you start working with them is that the optical axis is different than your working axis, which means that the horizon rotates. What I mean by that is that uh, with the exoscope, you normally stand straight and you just tilt the camera, which is different than what you would do with a microscope. With a microscope, you would tilt yourself as well. So you would use your proprioception also to guide you to your target. Whereas here, the problem is that, that you have to use other means to orientate yourself. And the problem is that it's not just in one plane, but it's actually in several planes at the same time. So it's not just in left and right direction. It's also forward and backward. Uh, and so the orientation initially can get actually quite difficult. And uh, 
uh, it might take some time to adjust to it. What it gives you as an advantage is that it gives you much better work ergonomics because unlike with the microscope where you have to really tilt yourself depending on the angulation of your device, with the exoscope you can just stand straight. An obvious situation would be, for example, here with a surgery for ACDF where very easily you end up working in a relatively awkward position. Another example, a posterior fossa in a park bench position, again, way more relaxed posture with the exoscope. And I must say that, that after switching to the exoscope, I feel less tired nowadays after long surgeries. The other thing is that each exoscopic system is different. And uh, to master one, you really have to use your experience. It takes quite a lot of time. And you definitely cannot expect that the first time you start using it, it will be uh, the same as, as the previous device. It's very different with microscopes, where if you even change a microscopic brand, so still the basic movement is always the same. You grab the handle and you just move the device. Whereas with the exoscopes, you really have to come up with different ways how to use it. And that takes time. So practice is essential, and you really need to spend quite a lot of time working both in lab as well as in your ORs, and then gradually developing your skills to going forward more and more difficult things. Is there a learning curve? In my personal opinion, there is a big learning curve. I would say that you get sort of like initial experience after a couple of weeks work. Then if you want to reach a certain level, you would have to work for maybe one or two months. And if you really want to master the device, in my hands, it took about six months before I felt completely confident with the new device. So my personal feelings about why I chose an exoscope and after these years that I've been working with them, so definitely the pros would be work ergonomics, you achieve much easily extreme angles, it allows you for more bimanual work, you get better lighting and magnification. From the teaching point of view, it's way better and even discussing because all the people in the OR see the same three-dimensional image as you. And I definitely see a huge potential for the future because it's a digital platform and it's much easier to adjust the digital image than with an optical image. The definitive con is uh, the, sorry, uh, is, uh, ooh, this was bad, this was bad. Just a second, I will jump to the to the last slide because that's my last slide here. Uh, yeah, here. So uh, is the learning curve. And uh, so based on this, I, I definitely give a thumbs up for exoscopes. And for those of you who might be interested, we are running a, a exoscopic life course. It will be next time in June the 3rd to 5th here in Helsinki. So you're welcome. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Martin, for this really good presentations on exoscope. Um, we're going forward with microscopes. Um, old lot never rusts, isn't it, Christian? You're muted. You're muted. Sorry, that's a beginner's mistake, so so to say. Can you see my slides now? Perfect. Yes. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you for having me. And it's a very interesting position I need to, to take today. Um, since I'm a little bit younger than, than Martin, not too much, but a little bit. And usually it's the, the exoscopes is the young topic and the microscope is the old guy's topic. So I had some issues in preparing that. So generally, for sure, an old love never rusts. And uh, my disclosures are not irrelevant since I received some, some money from Zeiss and some of the devices you'll see are Zeiss devices because of the pictures, not because I want to advertise them just to make, to make sure. So if we nowadays discuss whether to use a microscope or an exoscope or even an endoscope, then it's, it's dividing the people. People are um, banning the microscope because it's the old technology. You can't use that anymore. Exoscopes are much better. Um, and, and endoscopic is another thing we're going to hear about that later. So some people might think what I'm telling you now, I might regret that in the morning, but I don't uh, will not do so. So we had some issue, some some tests of exoscopes. We have a cooperation with an exoscopic company um, as well, but I will focus on 
this device only, on the magic of the microscope. Thank you very much. Oh, no, there's some more things to say. So if you like bubble wrap and you fancy the, 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 the sounds of bubble wrap, then I would suggest you have a device that makes it even more fancier. You can't use just the bubble wrap. So what problem are we solving with an exoscope? And I'm not sure about that. Even Martin um, give us, gave us some topics that are very interesting, like lighting and, and other things. But what problem are we solving? If you look at to, uh, through the internet, you can find um, neurosurgical departments that tell you the exoscope allows you to be safer and more efficient as a surgeon. Everyone in the OR is standing side by side looking at the exact same thing. And with that, I disagree because we're now also looking at the exact same, exact same thing. We can also have our microscope project three-dimensional images to the nurses if necessary. Our nurses don't want to do that because they need the 3D glasses on top of that. And you can have an issue with uh, the lighting of the rest of the room. So the pros and cons are, to my uh, personal opinion, easy. With a microscope, you have uh, sometimes a higher magnification. You have a very good depth perception and a good color perception. It's easy to use, mm, not so much. You will have some need some training also with a microscope. It has always a large footprint. Um, it's costly sometimes, and there's some issue with ergonomics. With the exoscopes, the maneuverability is much better as Martin showed you very nicely. It has sometimes a smaller footprint, some don't. So it's not always a small device. The magnification is also pretty high. Um, the depth perception is, is weaker. The color perception is a lot weaker. They still have some red issues. So either red is too red, or as we've seen some, some videos before, red is, is very pale. So that's, that's one of the things you might um, see in the exoscopes. They are fairly easy to use, as I would say. And they are also not the cheapest on the market. So if you look at the data that has the papers that have been written on that from the group from New York here mostly they are very fond of using exoscopes at some point they say the Ikinevo is around 1.5 million dollars so probably the US have a special price it's quite cheaper in the in 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 Europe so it's also not not um, not a present from the companies the Orbi for example what did we do with our exoscopes when we worked with that? We looked at the comfort and the ergonomics of the exoscope because that was our main issue. Um, you've seen the beautiful pictures of the surgeon moving with the microscope into an awkward angle. And uh, that's what we targeted in this in these two papers. And Anto will be talking about that later much more. So I'm just touching briefly on that topic. So on the right side in the video, you see the, the perfect example. And I have to mention that this specific exoscope is working with a head-mounted display. So you're actually looking into the displays in, in, in form of that um, goggles you're wearing. And you control the, ro the robotic scope, which is the, 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 um, the device here. You control that also with some gesture movement of your head. So you can keep your, um, your hands in the field at any time. That looked nice. And now you look at a more, much more experienced surgeon doing the same thing, talking about ergonomics. He wants to look somewhere else and he moves his whole body around and he, he gives it even farther, further. So not, not always a very ergonomics thing um, in this time. And he also needs some refixation of the, of the head mounted display. So that's things we've seen. If you use it properly, then it can be very ergonomic. But if you don't, it might be a problem. And also one topic I wanted to, to share with you is business. And the question is, are we as neurosurgeons really in the driver's seat of that innovation? And if you look at the market shares in the microscope market, but this is also including all types of medical microscopes, um, then this is a very tiny business part on the upper right side. But it's a growing part, and it's a growing part because of different, different things. And one of them is ophthalmology. If you look at 12.6 million people facing cataract surgery, you have an annual growth rate of microscopes of about 11%. And probably exoscopes are developed with neurosurgeons because we are so technologically um, um, interested 
but probably it's not not designed for us. That's one one question you need to ask yourself. And I think the if you compare that, around 2.6 million neurosurgeries, neurosurgical surgeries are done in the States per year. And we're facing 12.6 million cataract surgeries. Another issue that you don't have with a microscope, and that's why I prefer it sometimes, is your own eye. Um, there is conditions that you can't escape. And even that guy at some point will suffer some presbyopia. So your sight will change your eyesight. And if you look at the paper that was written by Peter Vaikotzi's group and the Thomas Picht's group about the exoscopic surgery, there's one very interesting part, and that's distance to the, the, the screen which we overcome with a head-mounted display in this part, but with the microscope, that's not an issue. The screen is right in front of you because you're looking into the microscope. Another thing is accommodative malfunction. So your eyes will have some changes over your years and also over the time of surgery. So you can have insufficient accommodation between your eyes and the screen. So even if you will uh, have a perfect focus from the, the exoscope down to the surgical field, you might have some problems accommodating to the screen, which will heavily impair your, your recognition of structures and heavily also impair your surgical, surgical strategy. And so with the, with the years to come, it will be worse. And 45 is kind of a, a cutoff year for, for the worsening of these accommodative problems. And 45 is not that old for a neurosurgeon, to be honest. Additionally, um, if you put it, um, if you put the the screen very near, you you, um, you have less headaches by the external screens. But if you put it um, like in a nice position, middle far away, you will have some headaches, some dry or irritated eyes, blurred vision sometimes because you're not used to look at the three D images with the three D goggles all the time. So also things you need to to keep in mind that are not a problem with a microscope. And the most important part of that particular study is the working looking angle. So if you look at the zero degree to your screen, your work position is optimal. With a 10 degree twist of your head, it will be noticeable that you have some problems in your hand-eye coordinated movement. At 30%, it gets uncomfortable. And at 45, it's impossible to do surgeries. But if we look at the graph of the graphic of the figure here in this paper, then the surgeon here is not looking at a 0% to the screen because he's also twisted towards the patient. 0% will be the end of the bed, end of the operating table, which is not the case in most of those, of those devices. Um, additionally, there comes also some blurring, some, some contrast, some depth perception is issues in the use of, of exoscopes that you don't have with a microscope because the lighter um, the lighter gray is the microscope actually. And if they compare different approaches, therional, frontal, frontal is light gray, therional is dark gray, hesitations in terms of, can I do that surgical movement? Can I do that surgical um, appliance of a clip, for example, are much more um, in, in the pterional position, movement corrections were more, direct sight control was much more. So people felt very comfortable doing rather easy frontal surgery, but not that easy, maybe pterional surgery in that, in that um, study. So even Peter didn't know the answer what to do with that, with that technology. So what are the solutions? Keep looking into the binoculars of a microscope. That's a one solution that works very well. Or and that might be the future, put the screens on the surgeon, some kind of glasses, some kind of, of devices that put the screen in front of your eyes, which will uh, relieve you of a lot of um, accommodation problems with um, exoscopes and usage problems with the exoscopes. Why are we not there yet? And you might know from the business perspective, the law of diffusion of innovation. So if you want to divide, if you build a new device and you want to diffuse your innovation, then you have a 2.5% who will get it anyway. Martin is in that 2.5%, a very an innovator, new technology. And he, he adopted that very well. And then you have a 13.5% of these early adopters. So the first 
16% are those who get the new iPhone really early, usually. The 16% in the end, they want to have their phone with their, with their, with their numbers back and they don't want to have screens. So you will never get them into the technology. So what do you need to act for exoscopes to, to break the neurosurgical resistance? The tipping point is around 16%. And I personally think, and I couldn't find any numbers to back that up. That's just my feeling. We are around here in the exoscope use. We have not reached this tipping point yet, probably because of the technology itself at the moment. Are there alternative technologies? Yes. I also found a paper where they use the mobile phone in, in low middle income countries to do some magnification. So it's the, 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 Apple, the Apple exoscope. You might just want to probably use loops instead. That might be the same thing. But I found it really nice to, to find uh, Marco Censato here with his his fellow in, in low and middle income country doing surgery into the phone. So from my perspective, exoscopes are not even not also pointless, but the rain boots that don't protect you from rain, the handy cup holder where you can put the cup on the table and the baguette backpack, which is my personal favorite. And as an old love never rusts, I totally believe in the years to come, we will be enjoying romantic walks on the beaches with our microscopes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. Now we have two people who argue, but there is one more pillar in cranial surgery. It's about the endoscopes. Domenico will talk about the endoscopes in cranial surgery. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Thank me. Thank you for having invited me over. Uh, it is a pleasure. Of course, like uh, my speech is focused on the endoscope here. I'll start by a solid things, like the most important things also in the school of Napoli. It is um, the microscope and the training in neurosurgery. This is our city with the Vesuvio and this is the Federico II Holy Emperor. It sounds strange. But also, if we are in the southern part of Italy, we have like a German descent because Federico II was from Sweden. And uh, this is a more like Latin guy and Giovanni knows him. It is Diego Armando Maradona. So neurosurgery, it's all about like, see what we are doing, right? Like, and this is the uh, room of Dr. Cushing back in the days. And he said like very clearly that every step of the procedure should be like clearly viewed and clearly defined. Of course, like I cannot uh, be devoted to this huge instrument that changed the life of our modern neurosurgery. And you already like explained very well, nothing to say about that, only like some things that you are doing here in Italy. And I'm proud of being a part of this committee of using the microscope in every single surgical school, because it is very important because of course, standing aside of the learning curve, you have more easy way of developing a visual comfort because it gives you like a 3D uh, view. Of course, it will orientate better because it is just coaxial sometimes with you. And there are a lot of things that have been just already discussed that I will go through. But look at this, like this is only like my, favorite picture. This is uh, one of my dissection. I, I trained a lot with the endoscope and that was my only unique uh, rehearsal with the microscope. And I'm very proud of that because the anatomy still stand uh, very nicely depicted in this picture. Of course, there are a lot of advantages, you know that, but why the endoscope? Why we are using the endoscope? If you think like that this instrument, maybe uh, it has been dating back even earlier as compared uh, to the microscope and of course to the exoscope. And you can maybe imagine that the Egyptian could enter uh, the network cavities, we have to uh, again uh, praise a German physician, like it was Philip Bozzini that developed this instrument that was called the Licht Lighter. And it was made very, very, uh, in a very easy way with the tube that was entering uh, that time was the bladder with the light standing um, made out of a candle inside this bulb over here. Then like things always burst uh, because there is a right man at the right time, and it, it, this guy, it is um, Walter Dandy, that, by the way, was one of the uh, worst enemy of Dr. Cushing, and he first attempted with the, these instruments that you see here, that is the ventriculoscope, the... <clears throat> 
coagulation of choroid plexus inside uh, a baby and it did it successfully. So it started like the neuroendoscopy as we know it today. But uh, in our school, uh, we are devoted, okay, there is no um, video, I'm sorry for that, of course. And this was the first surgery of Gerard Guillaume in Hospital Foch. And it was the first, as you might know, that uh, attempted the exploration of cellar cavity uh, after having removed the pituitary adenoma with the microscope. Why I'm, I'm showing you this? Because of course, like the quality of the image is not because uh, uh, it dates back uh, 70 years ago almost, but because that time was the quality, but above all, there was no light inside the surgical field. So the endoscope stayed there like under the ashes and we started again to use it like as the modern endoscopic skull-based surgery in 1997 uh, in Napoli, but basically it was already been adopted in several other centers, 1992 or 1993 uh, in France with the, uh, the ENT guys, Jankowski um, and other fellows over there. And we intend it as like seeing through. It is not anymore like the possibility of seeing details. Why I'm telling you this? Because of course, like the endoscope, it is a two dimensional view, but you can explore and you can imagine and you can discuss with your colleagues looking at the same images at the same time. There's no differences in between the first and second or third operator. Everyone that is inside the OR look at the screen and it has its own screen in a proper and ergonomic way. And on the other side, this is one of the most important concepts of the modern endoscopy. It is the possibility of bringing a cold light inside the brain, inside the skull, or like via the endoscopic endonasal corridor. And initially, why we retain it like that this thing was that great? Because we started investigating the anatomy. Maybe like we thought that initially that the anatomy was a different anatomy, not at all, because we started investigating, but then we realized that there was a comparison. So every structures that we've been uh, studying by a regular neurosurgical transcranial corridor can have like the exact view, but eventually like another correspondence with the opposite uh, form on the side of the endoscopy. Then we started measuring, then we start again like exploring and uh, speaking with the colleagues. Why with colleagues? Because every one of us had like to deal with this tremendous aspect as neurosurgeon. That is the ENT and this is the nose. So the first trick is to be stay oriented. And you see the endoscope can help a lot because you have two hands, you stay standing straight with your partner working on the same side of the patient. If you have like the same dominant hand and you recognize easily the anatomical landmark, although they are on a flat plane, because this is a 2D images, you can recognize like the right nostril here and the left nostril of the upper side. And on the other side, some, uh, let's say, uh, objection that has been moved to the endoscope is the fact that it is minimally invasive surgery. So eventually you are acting to create a small corridor. It is not that because the corridor has to uh, get you the correct orientation. Of course, you have to have the nice exposure, the nice identification over the anatomical landmarks, but above all, you have to have the proper maneuverability of the instruments at the level. And then also another very important thing is that the endoscope has cleared some very nice point over the pathophysiological uh, structures and the pathophysiological mechanism of the pituitary gland and of um, optic chiasm. Because you see here, like studying the anatomy, we have been uh, nicely recognize these arteries that are feeding the pituitary gland or the relationship with the chiasm, with the stalk and all the structures um, at the level of supracellular space or retrocellular space. And this is our endocrinologist. You see, like she said that as long as you use the endoscope, you recognize the gland. So if you recognize the gland, eventually working in this field, you will have higher chances of preserving the function and respecting the gland and giving back like a better patient uh, after the surgery. So you see, this is a nice case. We are working like with two uh, surgeons. One holds the endoscope and move it dynamically. It is a nice 
video is last generation HD camera. Um, Professor Cavallo has been involved in this surgery along with me. And you see at the end of the procedure, it was a GH secreting tumor. You can recognize at the center here, the gland and the medial wall of cavernous sinus with the, both the pulsation of CSF out of the diaphragm cell and um, toward the middle wall of the cavernous sinus with the ICA um, inside the cavernous sinus. So we thought this were like our main concept. So we had like a wider and, and orientable view. We can come close to the problem. We can have eventually have a nicer access because you have already dealt with the nasal structures. And of course, and above all, like we increased a lot the scientific activity and interdisciplinary co coordination. And also the patient has been like very uh, nicely, someone um, in the previous talk to, uh, spoke about the group of Ted Schwartz in New York, and it is a very monumental production of paper telling that like with the less nasal discomfort, with the uh, less postoperative pain, and of course, like a better patient compliance. And again, like what is the trick behind this one? There's no limit with the endoscope because, because as far as you come close to a structure, you identify, you identify the pathology and you can treat other lesions inside the, the dura. So again, like a nice uh, video showing you the recurrent case of a craniopharyngioma. It has been already operated by a regular transcranial corridor. You dissect with the so-called transubercum transplanum approach. You go and open the dura, but look at this, like you respect the chiasm because everything under control. You come and inspect the third ventricle chamber where the craniopharyngioma was harboring within. You are not um, uh, pushing above the gland. You have the chiasm, you have the uh, ICA with the ophthalmic cartilage here, and you did recognize the third ventricle in its interior. In the end, you also recognize the foramen of Morrow. And this is a very nice picture at the end of several explorations that gets you like a nice correspondence in between what we have been studying in the lab inside the third ventricles and the exploration with the endoscope in real surgery. So again, another major concept stands with the meningiomas and what to do in case a meningioma involving the anterior part Part of the sphenoid in the tuberculum cell or the planum sphenoidale, and if it was encroaching the nerve. This guy, Stefan Magil, now working in Northwestern University, had, had the opportunity of being in UCSF at that time, and he said that the endoscope can be very helpful, like in helping the decompression and improve the outcome of in, in terms of visual function. Because of what? Because you see, sometimes it is very easy to remove the meningioma because you have already devascularized, coagulating over the dura, but you have the opportunity to have uh, a very nice removal of the middle and inferior aspect over the optic nerve. And again, like you can easily recognize the structures that are uh, posteriorly to the clival area at the level of the dorsum cell. And again, like a nice correspondence in between the anatomical pictures and the uh, intrasurgical pictures. But uh, nowadays, I cannot uh, say um, that everything was nice with the endoscope. A lot of problems have uh, been um, raising because of the quality of imaging. And we cannot uh, be uh, not enthusiasts of this new technique because as being like an, an endoscopic surgeon as Dr. Lechka showed us, it is easier to watch at the screen using one of these guys here, uh, Olympus with the Orbi, EOS with the Esculap. And I am proud to tell also to Dr. Lechka that, that we have been using like this one that is comes from the Synaptive, that is a Canadian company. And this is again, Professor Cavallo in our meningioma case. And it is very nice. And it helps a lot in looking around the corner and looking around like the shadows and the hidden corners of the bone that have been not you uh, did not uh, prepared before. You see, that was. I would like to thank my team with Professor Capabianca, my mentor, Dr. Estasoma, Dr. Felice Sposi, Dr. Cavallo, and me. And I would like you to introduce this other aspect of viewing things. There is not the proper tool, maybe not the endoscope, not the microscope, not the endoscope. There is these other things that maybe you know it is called radiomics. Eventually, you know before entering the surgeon what you're talking about. In this case, we had a study on the consistency of the tutor adenoma. But but you can use whatever, like to define and predict whatever it is in skull-based surgery. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Domenico, for your talk. Very interesting perspective. And uh, you demonstrated really nice the advantages of endoscopy, which is a very odd technique. So we move now to spinal surgery. And uh, Alexandra Semona is going to demonstrate to us what is the power of endoscopy in spine surgery. So please, Alexandra, show us your case. Hello, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. So uh, let's switch to spine. Probably a little bit less interesting, to be honest. But uh, So I'm working in Sion, south of Switzerland. And we will talk a little bit about spinal endoscopy. So it's uh, quite now um, coming uh, for uh, many departments and many regions in the world, probably except in the US. <laughs> but um, now um, we have this uh, famous uh, endoscope, which, which is uh, in this uh, picture, a full endoscope. So everything is uh, going through a single working port, as you can see on the on the image. And uh, what is it exactly? It's actually a 4K camera, which is at the tip of the endoscope with an integrated light source, which is a LED uh, source. Um, the camera so of the endoscope is a 25 degree and uh, there is a water flow, so uh, going out of the endoscope and um, also a water flow coming out. And of course, you have the ability to move and uh, the ma magnification is actually that you are going further uh, in the depths. Um, it's a little bit an evolution of the metric system because um, you have the camera just at the tip of your instrument. The light source is also at the tip of your instrument. Uh, you can move it, which was not the case with the metrics that is usually attached to the table. And most importantly, there is this water flow, which is probably one of the reasons why, uh, and the if I can give you one reason to start endoscopy, it's uh, the infection rate. So the infection rate dropped dramatically with uh, the uh, spine endoscopy, and many uh, papers now show it. Uh, in our department now, we've been doing more and more spine endoscopy for the last four years. Now we do almost all cases uh, with the endoscope. And we actually saw, uh, without uh, uh, taking uh, really the numbers, but that the infection rate dropped dramatically. And we, uh, I think we didn't have any infection, no more than uh, 400 cases or 500 uh, nearly. And um, before that, we like everybody, we had uh, maybe um, five uh, yeah, maybe uh, two to two, two, one to two percent uh, cases with infection. Um, there is also the biportal endoscopy. I will not talk a little uh, too much about uniportal or biportal, but biportal you have uh, two working ports. One is for your instrument, and the other one is for the endoscope. Usually, when you do biportal endoscopy, the endoscope is a bit uh, uh, less quality. The image is a little bit uh, of uh, less uh, quality. Um, uh, so it's a, it's a little bit different. The advantage is that you can use your usual drill with your right hand or your usual carry sun punch. The disadvantage is that you are not working through the working cannula, so you cannot uh, use your working cannula as a retractor. Uh, many companies, they almost do all the same. The big advantage of spine endoscopy is that you can go through natural spaces. And there are two natural spaces to reach the spine is the interlaminar space uh, and the transforaminal space, uh, which is a, a little bit famous for Cambin, like a Cambin's triangle uh, from the tea leaf uh, literature. So those spaces, you can reach them without any drilling, just going through like a puncture, like a, a lumbar puncture if you do the interlaminar approach or um, like people are doing injection, uh, when you use the uh, transcombine or transforaminal approach. Here you can see a cadaver view, uh, left side, where uh, the working cannula of the transforaminal endoscope set is placed exactly in the cabin's uh, triangle, with number three is the exiting nerve root, and uh, one and two are the, uh, the, the part of the facet joint above and below, and you can see the, the transverse process, uh, six and seven, and uh, the pedicles four and five of the vertebrae above and below. If you if you do it uh, with just a, a phone uh, camera, you can see a little bit like this. 
if you use an endoscope here, it's a cheap endoscope, like you have uh, in the biportal endoscopy, it's actually endoscope assisted. It's not real, uh, like full endoscopy. It's endoscope assisted because you're looking with your endoscope, what is doing your, your right hand, but you can see uh, uh, the difference. Um, so when you start uh, and use the, the full endoscope, you can see a very detailed, <laughs> Here, anatomy of the of the little towel. So it's a very high resolution definition. If you do your skin incision and put your endoscope, so it's um, uh, eight millimeter or seven millimeter diameter working cannula, and uh, you have your uh, camera just at the tip of it with your light. So you, you can see that here it's not the maximum light, but the, the light is good. The resolution is optimal. You can see here it's a, quite an old patient. You can see fatty de degeneration in the bone. You can see all the, the little vessels in, uh, going through the, the bone. You, you can exactly see what you're doing with your, with your drill. Um, and of course, you can, you can appreciate the anatomy, like the more cranial attachment of the yellow ligament uh, towards the lateral part. Uh, you can use different instruments. And you actually, you move. So you can, you can really um, move your left hand, which is holding the, the camera uh, with your right hand, which is using the instruments uh, in order to get a very precise um, image and to see exactly what you're doing. And you can, you can see, appreciate every, every bite you take uh, if, it's, um, uh, if you're at the right place. So uh, of course, when, when you're with the, full endoscopy, and we, we've we heard uh, someone speaking about the learning curve. I will not speak a lot about it, but there is a, a huge learning curve, and especially the fact that you are really near the pathology, because actually you bring the light source and the camera to the, the, the pathology, you're really next to it, and sometimes you don't really see what where you are, because you're so zoomed in. And um, the other thing is that we are using a 25 degree endoscope, and some people compared the view that you can have with a zero degree and here 30 degree. Uh, so on the left side, uh, number A and C are the uh, 25 or 30 degree here, arthroscope or endoscope, and on the right, zero degree. So you can appreciate that you have a, a wider view. It's a little bit like the GoPro effect. And uh, even if you're really near from the, the pathology or the structures, you can have a very uh, uh, broad field of view and detail. Um, many applications, the, the, the big advantage of, uh, of, of uh, spine endoscopy is that you can really target your, uh, your work to a specific location and cause a minimal of morbidity to the surrounding structures in order to, for example, here, decompress a nerve root. Because, uh, for example, cervical posterior approaches they have been a little bit disregarded because you have to open all the muscles. People complain, you can be, uh, have a little bit of instability after that. But if you want to decompress a, a nerve root, you can do it with the endoscope through seven or eight millimeter um, diameter, a little incision. You go through the, to the bone, you identify and drill just the exact amount you need in order to uh, focus on the roof of the uh, foramen and see the exiting nerve root. Here, we didn't even remove any uh, yellow ligament. Um, so now we, we turn a little bit towards lateral. So here you can see on the left on, on the, of the screen already the foramen. So the, the, the root is already uh, nearly decompressed. And you can see the red uh, little bit uh, appearance of where the compression was. And actually, the yellow ligament is was kept intact because in the cervical spine, what you what you don't see in the books, but the yellow ligament attachment is not so lateral. The start of the root is already more lateral than the the insertion of the yellow ligament. So you you can do actually very precise and uh, very um, focused surgery through a very small hole. So. Uh, here you can see longus coli muscle in an anterior cervical approach where we used the endoscope just as a, an, an assist. So it's not full endoscopy here, it's assisted. And you can see the longus coli muscle is just the insertion point for an odont odontoid screw uh, placement. And uh, can I go 
next one. Um, the other advantage um, is that you can move it. So, for example, you can you can uh, decompress two, even three um, lumbar levels through a single incision because uh, you are not inside an eloquent structure because you're going through uh, the, the the spine, the, the muscles. So you you can move. It will not destroy something. You can you can just move your camera up and down and focus on one uh, one lamina, the other one, just by, by moving a little bit and uh, sliding uh, inside the, the body. And you can actually decompress two, three levels through a seven or eight millimeter incision. Um, of course, one of the, the biggest advantage is to go through the transforaminal space and especially in a thoracic uh, disc, uh, you can access the pathology without uh, going trans thoracic, without uh, removing uh, huge parts of bone. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually you can take advantage of the uh, anatomy and the, the natural cambium space. And drilling a little bit of the SAP is uh, mandatory to, to reach the ventral part of the tickle sac and, and uh, be able to remove even to the midline or even further um, without, uh, without being too morbid with the anatomy. And uh, it's, uh, it's a great thing to see that you, you can remove those pathologies uh, with a, a very easier and uh, less morbid approach than what we, we've learned when when we did our training. And I think that's most of it. Um, so in conclusions, it's a, it's a little bit like a keyhole uh, surgery concept. You, you really do a very small opening at the skin and then you can have a broad access inside. Um, this was possible because of the technology that evolved a lot. So uh, many of uh, our colleagues and my mentor uh, did uh, full endoscopy many years before, but because of the evolution of the technology, now it's uh, really more accessible and it's very safe because you can see every bite that you take uh, exactly what you're what you're doing and what you're taking the the main disadvantage is the learning curve so you need to be prepared to uh, spend a lot of time and probably to have people around you that guide you in order to make it uh, to make it uh, happen in your department thanks a lot Thank you, Alexandra. Um, beautiful cases. So we're going to discuss at the end. There was a, also a question from the audience. Um, so now we proceed with Anto Abramovic from Innsbruck, who is going to talk on um, the use of exoscope in uh, spine surgery. Anto, please give your talk. All right. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, my job is can to you, tell you. Can you share your slides? Sorry. Yeah, do you see them right now? Not yet. Okay, just a second then. I'll try it again. Better? No, still not. Okay, now it works. Perfect. All right. So like I said, my job today is to explain you or to describe why the exoscope is the future in, in spinal neurosurgery. Um, we do have some kind of conflicts of interest. Um, we had, as Christian already mentioned, scientific and clinical cooperation with one of the exoscope producers, BHS Technologies, but there were no financial conflicts of interest. These were the two studies we performed using the company's um, product. We all know that spine surgery has experienced a transition from a Firstly, very open surgery to some kind of minimally invasive uh, surgical specialty. And uh, that came with the increased uses of lightning and microscopes during the last decades. Nowadays, the operating microscope is the standard for intraoperative visualization. But this also has some drawbacks. We already know, firstly, out of smartphone uh, research, actually, but now also um, in work-related um, research that this bad posture we sometimes take into account when operating with a microscope, especially taking into account things like a lumbar decompression with undercutting where you really have to tilt the microscope. 
sometimes leads in the long term to degenerative spine diseases, which not only prevents us from working, but also leads to some kind of treatment and even surgical, as recent reviews have shown. The worst part we could expect out of this is that we as surgeons become worse than our patient themselves. And that's something we clearly want to avoid. So one of the strategies is the exoscope. It's not the only advantage, but one of the biggest. Um, I think everyone is familiar with the with the function and working of the exoscope, so I'll just skip that. Um, we have seen some tremendous increase in surgical and scientific interest in the last um, years. So that's something which still, as Christian already said, is in the beginning of its evolution. Exoscope models, there are tons of it, so I won't go in that into detail. What I wanted to tell is that they're basically um, five different rings, how you can control those things. It's either by hand, head gesture, mouthpieces, voice control even, and foot switches. The pictures can then be shown to us via monitors as on the uh, left upper corner or on head mounted displays, looking like a VR goggle on the right lower corner, as you can see. Talking about the technological advantages, we've already heard pretty much of it. Um, the resolution and image quality is equivalent, if not even higher compared to some operative microscopes. The reason for that is to one part, the software-based um, execution of those videos and pictures. That's something we can we know already from our smartphones, talking about the night enhancement, the night vision with, with, uh, with cameras using, used by smartphones. That's something that can be trans transformed in, in uh, surgical exoscopes as well. The switch to operative microscopes in spine surgery has been shown in 5.8% in recent studies. This is mainly, or this mainly happens in in uh, in some kind of complications, and that's to my, to my mind, I think that's a lot on on a psychological basis as well. Because of course, if something bad happens, you tend to go to to things you already know and you're familiar with, which usually is the operator, oper, operative microscope. But still, six percent is pretty decent for uh, for the switching rate, especially in the beginning of such a technology. The distance between the surgical field and an exoscope, to my mind, is very important, especially in spine surgery, because you, you tend to switch between macro and micro surgery. In imagining a T-lift surgery, spondylolysis, things like these, there are some parts where you would like to use your microscopic view, for example, decompressing the nerve root or decompressing in lamina. But on screw insertion or cage insertion, you definitely do not want the microscopic view. And that's something you usually had to take your microscope in, out, in, out. Now it's just a look on the surgical field on the monitor again. So there's not much of a difference regarding the time and um, regarding the benefits using these kinds of technologies. And of course, as already mentioned, there is a beneficial effect for education and communication. If everyone looks at the same monitor, it clearly is easier for the surgeon to explain what he does compared to a surgical microscope where the surgical assistant, for example, has to th overthink everything in the wrong direction. Um, also regarding communication with the whole OR team, um, especially regarding the, the handling of the instrument, it's much easier to handle those instruments when you don't have this bulky, big in microscope in front of you. When doing the comparison for spine surgery in microscope versus exoscope, there are some two excellent um, uh, meta-analysis um, where uh, the improvement of the exoscope has been shown for, of course, surgical ergonomics, as already said, educational usefulness, but also handling surgical field and even video quality has been described better compared to the operative microscope. Of course, this is something that shouldn't be told in general, but there are models that work better than, than, than operative microscopes. Talking about the clinical data, um, until now, there hasn't been much of a difference um, regarding surgical time, interoperative blood loss, which is a good factor in, in, in total, but there also have been some kind of studies um, and meta-analysis that have shown a decreased bleeding rate in, in exoscopes. This is also a fact which shouldn't be taken into account right now because it's very important how experienced the surgeons and the whole surgical team is with these kind of techniques. So this is something that needs more prospective studies to really see the effect of it. The clinical applications have already been uh, shown in, in a literature review regarding spine surgery. This is something we already have mentioned, so I'll just skip that. We have the ergonomic benefits, we have the greater ease of assistant participation, I've already told, and especially important, non-inferior complication rate. When talking about the learning curve, something we already heard about endoscopy for a part, um, there is a recent study in 2024, I guess it was, um, showing that the learning curve 
was already significant in the first 20 to 30 cases. So this is something that really um, helps us um, adapting to it. Of course, the quality will increase with further cases and I'm definitely sure the learning curve will take time and need time, but we already see out of our personal experiences as well that this technology can lead to a very fast adaption of the surgeons. Talking about personal experience, we have uh, performed one study um, with our neurosurgical team. We invited our surgeons to, inv uh, to participate in a single level thoracolumbar decompression. They got a 30 minute training course beforehand and had then to operate on a human cadaver, a sole decompression without undercutting and without uh, muscle preparation. We, we, we did a video analysis of the surgery itself to see if there have been any mistakes provided or if there hasn't, has been problems with the controls of the, of the exoscope and with the post-interventional questionnaires. What we've seen is that the time of the compression was very surprising, 15 minutes from start of the laminotomy to finalize the compression solely for the bony decompression, but still with a new exoscope never used or just 30 minutes before by those participants. We had three dropouts in this group, um, mainly because of headache, dizziness, and blurry vision. And we assume that this is uh, that the reason for this is the head-mounted display. This model is is as uh, Christian has already um, described has is a VR goggle which which is um, controlled via head gestures. And if you don't prepare, and I think that's something that that's important for other exoscopes as well. If you don't prepare your surgical field, your monitor, your head-mounted display that it really fits perfectly to your head and to your vision, you will have problems during the whole surgery. So that's something you have really be aware of if you start working with exoscopes. The surgeon's satisfaction was 84%. So that's something we talked about, image quality, video quality, contrasts, um, colors, and things like this. This was very sufficient in this study. What we actually ex expected from this study was that we have a lot of young surgeons, a lot of technically interested surgeons that would like to see how those things work and that are really interested. Contrastingly, we saw that even the experienced surgeons were very familiar after some time with, with the, the exoscope and that they were very interested to use that in the, in the OR. The feedback we got um, was, of course, intuitive handling. This was something the user interface really was um, um, helping us with. There was hardly any technological knowledge required for this. Of course, we had a 30 minutes uh, pre-interventional training, but still it's a short amount of time thinking about a new technology you, you use. Um, sufficient image quality, um, ergonomic body posture is already, is already said. Um, of course, there has to be mentioned that those ones who had very much experience with an operating microscope tended to tilt their body more than those who were not that familiar with operating microscope. That's something you po potentially lose during um, a higher uh, frequency of, of exoscope usage. And the, the feeling of safety to be ready for the OR with the exoscope was something that amazed us in, in, our, in our group. We, already, we also had some negative aspects. We had the frequent need for technological assistance, which is something, I guess, that happens pretty often whenever you use a new technology. So that's something you have to be aware of in the beginning. Headache and blurry double vision was something I would say is a secondary reason or, or the reason for these problems is actually the preparation. So be aware of that. That's a slide I, I showed a few months ago at another presentation. I'm a guitar player. This is my setting for, for an electric guitar with a huge amount of amplifiers, um, um, effects, electric guitar, cables around everywhere. So that's something I typically use when I really need that special tone. Um, uh, the, the time to, to click this everything in and get it on running is about 20 minutes. But when I come home and when I have the feeling and the urge that I want to play a song uh, or something very specific, of course, I will use the acoustic or Western guitar. So when talking about spine surgery, of course, the operating microscopes today, they have a lot of, of uh, techniques and a lot of things. The exoscopes may not be fulfilling right now. But for everyday business, for everyday surgeries you perform, the exoscopes is more than fine, gives you good communi communication with your team, gives you good body posture, and is so-called better for your future outcomes. And what also has to be mentioned is that exoscopes to this day only show a paucity of things they actually can do. Talking about head-in-head -head display, talking about AR inclusion, that's something you can only do in a system which is software-based, so you can change that 
much more and much easier compared to the operating microscope. So in conclusion, I would say the exoscope is better for communication in the OR. It has an improved maneuverability at the surgical field, not only of the surgeon, him or herself, but also of all the instruments used in the surgery. It has a quick switch from macro to micro surgery without removing the exoscope. So you can use your screwdrivers, rongeurs without removing everything else. For the surgeon, um, him or herself, it means improved ergonomics. That's a clear state. It means better eye-hand coordination, which is still eminence-based. There hasn't been any, any study on that one. And the reduced work-related diseases, which we will only see in the next few years and decades from now on. For the patient, until now, there's clear non-inferiority regarding the post operative outcome, but there are a few studies lacking, so we need time on that one. We still have to be aware that the exoscope is at an early stage. We still have time to improve. We need to improve. And that's why I think all the, the community's input is very important to build up that technological advantage in, in exoscopes. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Anto. We will start with the discussion round now. So first of all, there are two questions from the audience, and then I'm going to switch to Giovanni. So um, I basically try to combine both questions in one. Those questions are to Alexandra. Um, in regarding uh, the cost efficiency, time efficiency, and also complications management and um, safety for your patients, can you comment on the advantages and disadvantages of spinal endoscopy and what is also the learning curve? Is it an appropriate technique for uh, residents or is it something for specialists? And how long did it take it take you to develop your skills? Yes, so I can see the question. So first, Nikolai, um, uh, I think that uh, there, is, there will be always a, a place for open surgery. And I think that residents sh and specialists should know both techniques. Of course, now we teach our residents more uh, endoscopy than open surgery, but there is a field where open, open uh, let's say, so surgery will, will be uh, mandatory. It's when you, when, you, um, uh, when you have to deal with intradural pathologies, for example, because you need bimanual handling. Uh, in, if, if you start uh, with meningiomas and you never did a, a disc herniation uh, with the microscope, you will be in trouble. So I think it, uh, it's uh, important that, uh, that uh, both techniques are uh, learned and teached. Um, if you target, if you want to have a private practice, probably it will be a little bit like a vascular surgeon or something like that. So if you, if you are in a private practice, probably you need more endoscopy than open uh, surgery at some stage, uh, but it's uh, good to, to learn both. For the other question, um, of course, uh, at when we started, because there is a, a big learning curve, and um, we we had we did a little mis a little bit of mistakes. We had some uh, CSF leaks, or we couldn't uh, like orientate or uh, reach the pathology. So we opened up. Um, now I think we we did not uh, convert so uh, from an endoscopic uh, surgery to an open surgery. I don't remember the last time. Uh, I think many reasons for that. First, uh, because of the water flow, there is a kind of hydro dissection. So you are expanding the epidural space. Your, your dural uh, sac is uh, going away from the flow of your endoscope and uh, not the yellow ligament, for example, or the other structures. So it's, I think it's less risky actually to do a, a dural tear with the endoscope. Um, and, all, and also because you keep uh, structures wet, uh, you don't have this uh, aspect of uh, dryness of the dural sac, which is um, like uh, some uh, risk factor for dural tear. And if you do a dural tear, uh, first we said, oh my God, let's open, let's suture. And now we don't do it anymore because uh, there is no dead space. So if you do a little dural tear uh, while you're doing endoscopy, uh, just close. Nothing will happen because the, there is no space for the the the, the CSF to come out and uh, to leak uh, to the skin. Well, uh, I would disagree that it's usually the the situation, but sometimes you have also patients uh, who are symptomatic with CSF leak, and um, then you have to do either a blood patch or even revise them. So um, you have always to be keen of your technique and what is the best technique for the patient um, in your hands so um, but, uh, Stefan, if you're not experienced it de depends on the cases of course are you speaking about uh, monoportal or biportal cases 
I think both techniques are challenging and you have a certain learning curve. And of course, um, it needs a lot of cases until you're very confident and you can manage all your complications. So we can start doing the most challenging um, cases like the one that you have uh, demonstrated with the thoracic disc herniation. Yes, but I, I, just for the question of the dual tear, probably there is a slight difference between bipartal and monoportal endoscopy because in bipartal endoscopy, you, you have this, uh, this water flow that comes out in a, in, in a space uh, that you create. And uh, that's not the case with uh, uh, full endoscopy. So probably the, the dual tear management is a little bit more, uh, I would be a little bit more concerned with bipartal than, than monoportal. I don't know if, it, if that's your experience the patients you 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 told us about uh, the the leaks, probably it's more with uh, bipotal or did you have any leakage with uh, monoportal as well in your experience? Oh, I think it's getting very specific, but yeah, I had a patient who has been operated monoportal um, technique, but it was a cervical discectomy, and um, this patient needed a re um, revision and a lumbar case uh, where we had an intraoperative uh, dural leak. We have revised it microsurgically during the same case, but um, it's not very common. And if you're um, keen with your technique, if you um, try to do it um, in a very anatomical and uh, strategic and structured way, it normally it doesn't happen very commonly. So thank you very much, Alexandro. Giovanni, you had a question. Yes, Stefan. Uh, first of all, let me say thanks to the to all the speakers for their outstanding presentation and for being uh, with us today, sharing their knowledge. And uh, I have two questions. The first is for Martin and Anto uh, about uh, the setup of the operating room using the exoscope. Um, because with the exoscope, you need probably much more space for not only for the exoscope, but also for this large screen. So may it be a problem, uh, the setup of the operating room, if you are uh, switching from microscope to exoscope, and uh, both in cranial and spinal surgery. And the other question is for uh, the cranial guys. So is for Martin, Christian, and Domenico. Uh, do you think there should be a role for endoscopic assisted surgery today uh, in cranial neurosurgery? I mean, combining endoscope with exoscope or endoscope with microscope. For example, in the past, it has been suggested for surgery in posterior cranial fossa just to look around the corner. What do you think about that? Well, I can first start with the uh, with the question on on the setup. So I don't think that the size of the OR is the problem because usually when I if the patient is in supine position, I'm at the head, so I normally keep the big screen at the feet of the patient. So it doesn't really take that much more space than than a microscope would, especially nowadays with the modern microscopes. You still usually have some sort of screens in your in your OR. I think the important thing about setup is that you have to really think differently than with a microscope. So you have to look for optimal position for the exoscopic device you are using and each exoscopic device is different. So you have to position it in a different place and to look for optimal angulation of the camera because uh, there might be some restrictions related to the robotic stand that the camera is standing on and that will affect you how you can tilt it or how you can maneuver it. So that's something which comes in with experience. It's very difficult to hit the right position during your first trial. And I think that uh, if you decide that you want to go into exoscopic surgery, you have to be patient and uh, you have to kind of take the attitude that it's not the same thing as taking a different microscopic model. You actually have to rethink certain things and uh, you have to maybe alter your way of work to a some, to some extent so that it would fit with the new technique. The other question about the endoscopy assisted surgery i know that there are surgeons who use it a lot uh, i personally don't have that much experience with it i tried it at one point in my career uh, maybe it was that i didn't have the right setup at that time and besides i was working with a microscope at that time and it was quite difficult to simultaneously look into the oculus and actually to see the image of the endoscope i think that with the exoscope it might be a little bit easier because you can have the two screens next to each other so it might be easier, but I mean, so far I have not really tried it again, but maybe I should. You're right. 
I think it's a it's a basic question of what you're doing endoscopically assisted. Do you need the endos the exoscope uh the endoscope to keep it right to need the endoscope to just look around the corner? Then I would not use a classic endoscope as we've seen it with the endoscope tower and everything. There is tools for that to just look around the corner. If you plan it to do like a microsurgical endoscope assisted surgery, I think there's a place for that. Um, but I think it's not not many places for that. There's some cases where you can nicely do that, where you have a limited space of approach. But just to look around the corner, in my personal experience, it's too much of a of a hassle and too much of time to get the endoscope fully blown into your. Okay, um, I think Christian, you have one more question or? Yes, also, also, also endoscope. And um, guys, um, I apologize. It sounds rather critical, and but I actually see that you are both working in very experienced endoscopic centers for either spine and brain surgeries. Um, I'm always curious. I was wondering why this technology didn't take off yet. We have endoscopes around for 20, 25 years or longer. Since the past 10 years, they've been much better using 4K, 3D, whatever, you name it. But still, this is a niche technique. What, what, what's going, what's, what's the withhold for people to use the endoscope? Very good question, Christian. <laughs> um, so, Alexandra and uh, Domenico, what do you think about it? Why don't more people use the endoscope on a standard or quite standard basis? Uh, may I? Yes, please. Yeah, I'd like an answer from both of you. So anyway, yeah, yeah no, I, I'm just asking Alexander, like because I'm going first. Like so, if Alexander agrees, I'll go first. So that that is a nice question, and probably I already disclosed. Like that is not a matter of technology. It's not a matter of the tool you are using. Uh, it is a niche, maybe, but maybe also like other kind of surgery are niche, other fields of neurosurgery are niche because not the endoscope will allow you like to be a surgeon. It, it is a way of doing your stuff. Of course, like an endoscopic and an asal in particular has been expanding a lot. Uh, still, like there are several advantages. So if you know the pathology, maybe you can choose. And if you are... Uh, familiar with different solutions, then you can choose the best solution. Like, again, uh, of course, like we have the endoscope and we try to push a little the limits, but before pushing the limits, we have been doing a lot of work. So I'm not uh, really sure that it did not take off, but still, it's there. You can use it if you want. Like, there are things that are beautiful to do with, but no way. Let me just re refine my question. If you compare it to general visceral surgery, nobody is doing open gallbladder surgery anymore. Everybody does laparoscopy. Everybody. I have ne never seen or doing an open gallbladder even in very complex cases. But in neurosurgery, endoscopic surgery is not everybody's darling. Oh. Can I, can I say something? I don't know for spine. Yes, Alexander, you go because like in brain, I don't think you can go everywhere with the endoscope, but still you can try. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think there are, there are maybe some, uh, um, I will try to, to get you some points to for an answer. So first, I think it's like an endoscopy for pitre trees. So we all know that, uh, yeah, the, the, the boss of our department still uh, was doing it with the microscope, uh, you know, because he learned like that. And uh, even if uh, everybody is doing with the endoscope. So uh, now, uh, not our boss uh, here in Sion, because uh, he learned with the endoscope. But uh, uh, so I think for, for every technique, there is a little bit of delay because the people in place, uh, they are a little bit older and pr probably don't want to get in a new technique because of the learning curve and so on. So there is a little bit of delay. That's probably one part of the of the of the answer. The other one is that for spine endoscopy, there is a problem with the with the money. It costs more money because you have disposable. Uh, 
which is the, the RF probe. Uh, so uh, if you do a case, it's actually cheaper with the microscope than with the endoscope. So if you work in a private practice, uh, they will say mm, uh, it's more expensive. You take more time because you're a beginner. We have no interest. If you are in a, in a university hospital, they will say uh, if we have too many people to teach already open uh, a way to, to remove this hernia. Uh, it takes too much time, so it's not interesting. So we are a regional hospital. Probably it's a good uh, setting to, to uh, do this. But I can see that it's not everywhere. But uh, speaking with uh, my younger colleagues, uh, I think it's it's picking up. But we will see, I think, in, in 10, 20 <coughs> years, if everybody uh, does endoscopy or not. Yeah, I would like also to comment to this, uh, Christian. As you told us, gallbladder surgery is laparoscopic nowadays. But you know, in laparoscopic surgeries, you have a very big room uh, where the older organs are with uh, a lot of gas inside. So you have a very nice visualization and a very broad illumination. And in spinal surgery, at least, um, when you do a spinal endoscopy, it's a very tiny uh, corridor through which you're working. And it's also in skull base. So it's... Um, Kind of I very totally delicate technique. Acknowledge your 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 ex explanation, but a tiny corridor has never has never scared a neurosurgeon off. Not it's at not, all. But it's not the size of the corridor. I think. I think it's I'm not afraid. that intuitive because we don't start with this technique at the very beginning of our education, as everybody just commented on. Um, but maybe we can proceed to the next question, Diogo. Hello, everyone. First of all, congratulations on your presentation. I think it's, um, it's a wonderful uh, panel. Uh, and we, we got to see a little bit of all the techniques throughout cranial and spine. Um, I think just to, to comment on what was said, um, I, I still work in the department. I started doing spine endoscopy three years ago. Um, and I still work on a department that some colleagues of mine still doing fully open uh, laminectomy. So to, to, we have the broad spectrum uh, of, of everything. And to, to answer Christian, I think the, the answer is in your presentation. I think we're still, we're passing the tipping point right now. And, and it's true, we have endoscopy for more than 20 years, um, but no one was using it because, you know, the, even the, the, technique, the technique itself, the materials, it, it's all changed right now um, and it's evolving. So I do believe, uh, as uh, Stefan said, there's still room for, um, well, uh, mini open or tubular access uh, surgery, uh, specifically for, for um, difficult cases in, in uh, dural tears and that happen in, in endoscopy, although the risk is actually smaller if you know what you're doing. Um, I had a question for, for Martin, uh, which was concerning the, the exoscope. Is, and, and the question is simple. Is there any, any surgery that you're still doing with the microscope or uh, other type uh, that it's not using the exoscope or just using exoscope and all your surgeries? This is an easy answer. So no, I do everything with the exoscopes. And, and I must say that nowadays, if I have to operate with a microscope, I actually feel uncomfortable because I think that it's limiting me in certain, especially visualization angles that I would prefer to use, but I can't because I'm working with a microscope. But I mean, right. it takes time, it takes time. And just a follow-up question on that. Um, you're still you're using an exoscope that has fluorescence, correct? Yes. Yes. And yes. there's no no difference between you know using five ALA with the exoscope versus this microscope in your point of view. Uh, there probably is. Of course, you have to kind of get adopted to each technology mm -hmm. you're using. Uh, you are right that, for example, for the use of gliolan. Uh, the studies have been done on a microscope. So actually there's no validation as such for using exoscopes on that. Uh, but I mean, it works, but it's not validated in a proper proper way. Wonderful discussion. So Martin, one more question to you from Thomas PDF. Uh, he is not any more with us because he's on call, but um, he asked me to, um, to Propose the question, and it's um, about the case selection. 
with which cases would you start uh, to operate on an exoscope? Um, and maybe also the same question to Anto. Uh, I think you have to start something uh, with something you are comfortable with. So uh, probably not a good idea to start something that you already are at your limit, even with a microscope. Uh, what I did myself, I, I started initially with spine. I did, um, I don't know, five to 10 cases of spine first. And then quite fast, I, I transformed to more complex things, but I mean, I was already quite an experienced as a, as a neurosurgeon when I, when I started starting using it anyway. Uh, I mean, the way how it went initially was that I always wanted to have in the beginning, I wanted to have the microscope inside the OR draped. Then at one point, let's say after a month. Uh, so I said that I want to have the microscope in the OR, but they don't have to drape it. And let's say maybe after three, four months, I told them that they should take the microscope out of the OR because it's taking space. So that that's how the learning <laughs> went. But I mean, when I see it with our residents, so I must say that their learning curve is different because they don't have the experience with the microscope. So for them, it doesn't actually matter whether they train microsurgery with exoscope or microscope. I mean, they still, still are training, training microsurgery as such. So I think this question of a switch, it's more for us who are more experienced, who already have learned habits, and we have to relearn them. Whereas for somebody who is entering the field as a sort of blank page, I think it would be the same thing for endoscopy. So initially, it's actually much easier because, I mean, you, you are not relearning something. You are just learning the first thing. And so that's, that's the difference I have seen with our residents. So they seem to adopt way faster because of this. Uh, I, Thank I, you, Martin. I could... I couldn't agree more with, with Martin, to be honest. Uh, uh, Christian was showing us the videos of, of a very experienced and, uh, uh, and uh, a new uh, resident um, back then. Um, and you basically see the exact thing. And somebody who was using the exoscope for a pretty long time has the problem that he still wants to adopt to the body movements, which he's used to in the microscope which is not usually not or doesn't happen in the in the in people who are not very experienced and and as martin already said i i, I think the the way to start with with surgeries is is a very classical like for, like for example a lumbar decompression something you're very okay with in, in independent of what you use as another um, technique and step by step you need to 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 improve and and to get into contact what's very important what we have seen in in our um, implication is that uh, pre-interventional training is very important so the, the the training is basically to get you used to the new user interface because of course there are differences in our um, um, exoscope we have used. The user interface is is totally different from the microscope. You just use your head movements to do the zooming, to do the focus and everything else. So that's something you should be aware of beforehand because if something happens during surgery that stresses you out anyways, it is very difficult to then try to use and find the right controls. So that's something you have to be aware of in the beginning. Thank you, Anto. So it's a very vivid, controversial topic and um let's see we have three more questions and then i would uh, suggest to end the discussion because we are over time but uh, giovanni please your question no i'm not a question i want to to step back to the discussion that we had before when we when uh, christian said that the endoscopy is still a niche i disagree with this uh, sentence uh, especially for when, when we are talking about uh, endonasal transphenoidal surgery. I think in this case, uh, I don't know what Domenico think about it. In this case, for endonasal transphenoidal surgery, endoscopic surgery is the gold standard. I don't know any surgeon who, who operate on a pituitary adenoma uh, transcranially or using the no. microscope. We can discuss when we are talking about extended approaches like uh, for surgery or anterior skull-based meningiomas. In, in that case, probably um, we can compare micro transcranial and endoscopic approaches, but for pituitary surgery, probably also for some complex cases like uh, clival cordomas, probably endoscopy is uh, the best way to approach this kind of pathologies. What do you think, Domenico? Uh, 
Giovanni, thanks for having remarked such an important things. Like uh, I, I raised the end, like before, like to complete the discussion with Christian. I don't think it is a matter of how you big it is the corridor. The endoscope will not allow you like a different surgery. Uh, endoscopic and nasal, as has been said, it's more like a gallbladder surgery, as Stefan said. Like you have white space. Like lot of air that is there, like because you have paranasal paranasal cavity, and you can enter easily the pituitary. Still, if you're not familiar with the intradural space, you cannot go for a craniopharyngioma, for instance, that is very close to the hypophysial region, but it's totally a different uh, lesion. Again, like meningiomas, like if you would like to call it a matter of sites, we can call it like you cannot go for a huge meningioma via the endoscope or via the nose because it will take forever. And also the anesthesiologist will blame you and the patient will be not recovering that well because he does not have a small scar. That's it. One last question, Milan. You're muted. I had to keep it quiet. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for fantastic lectures. And I just wanted uh, to talk about uh, the stuff that actually uh, for exoscopes, I think these are definitely the future. And the people who are trained uh, lately, who are whose departments have already switched to exoscopes, are probably going to be only exoscope trained. And uh, you can you can do everything you can do with, with uh, microscope you can do with exoscope but uh, i wanted to ask alexander primarily that uh, for do you think that for herniated discs you can do every single case with the with the endoscope because uh, still so many departments the majority of departments are still doing microsurgery for feeling like it but uh, that it is similar better or something and uh, I feel that uh, like when I watch images because or videos because I, we don't do any endoscopy uh, in my department, I feel like it's much better visualization. It is much less bleeding, and it looks uh, so 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 much superior to to microsurgery. So is it just like the uh, under underrated option, or you still sometimes need to use microscope to do something? As I think Alexander, you you look like you you talk like you you do everything with exoscope uh, with endoscope only. Yes, so I I think it's it's really de dependent on on your level and on the time uh, you want to spend because <laughs> of course when you when you start you will need a lot more time to do what you already know to do in a very small amount of time with the microscope. So it's it's a little bit a question of your of your level but, and when you start you do only if you L5, start... S1, L4, L5, uh, lumbar disc herniation, paramedian uh, with a huge interlaminar window. So you select your cases and as uh, and when but, you when you start to improve, how about less you, selection? Sorry. How about if you yeah, start yeah, with the, if you start with endoscope only? If you are new trainee and you go with uh, endoscope only can you like in future do everything with endoscope and you don't need microscope anytime what do you think Pro is it possible Pro probably for most of the cases but i would not say 100 percent. for example uh, redos where you have fibrosis you need probably more bimanual handling if you go intradural, you need bimanual handling. Okay. The problem is your left hand is stuck with your with your endoscope. You cannot okay. use your left hand uh, to dissect structures. So every time you need bimanual uh, handling, probably you have to reconsider. Okay. okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the very nice talks and presentations and uh, for the very vivid discussion. Uh, obviously, we can sit the whole night and discuss about it because we agree to disagree. There are a lot of advances, a lot of uh, technological and uh, also technical um, things that everybody uh, can do better than other people. And we have just to decide what is the best in our hands for our patients. We need uh, an armamentarium of... Um, 
exoscope, probably microscope and endoscope in the future. But uh, for right now, microscope, I think, is uh, still the current standard in most departments. So let's see how it develops the next years. Thank you and uh, have a good evening and see you soon. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Bye. Have a nice Thank day. Bye. bye. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Bye-bye.